begin with a few disclaimers. Um, the first is that um, I will be reading parts of my presentation. And part of that is because, um, because that's what we do in philosophy of education. So part of that is also kind of exposing you to what might it look like for, for a philosopher to take up questions that arise in early childhood education. Um, it's, it's not a, a typical research presentation, I think, as you may have um, heard it. Um, and so that's so part of that. That's deliberate. I'm also kind of sort of you know trying to enact philosophy of education um, rather than than talk about it. The more important disclaimer is that I'm really not an early childhood education scholar, right? I couldn't claim that at all. Um, I've never taught in early childhood education, nor have I systematically studied that field. But. Over the past decade or so, I have found myself working with a number of uh, doctoral students who are all in early childhood education in one way or another. And um, so hopefully I've learned something from them over the years. I don't know if I've learned enough, but I've learned a bit through them and have been exposed to some of the debates and the conversations that are going on in the field of, um, of early childhood education. And so I want to mention them initially, and they're just listed in the order in which I started working with them. Um, why they're all Latin American, I have no idea. That's a, that's a topic for another exploration. Um, but um, so Cristina Delgado is finished, is teaching at Capilano. Alejandra is here. Claudia Diaz um, cannot be here, um, is, uh, is traveling today. And Aurea is here. And so it's really through working with them. Uh, and I'm particularly happy that Alejandra is here because the whole point of departure for this conversation is um, something that was said by Karen Alnervik. And I'll come to that um, in a minute. And uh, it was in a conversation with Alejandra. And I only met Karen through Alejandra. So, so it was in. Um, in 2014, uh, that I had the opportunity to meet um, two remarkable early childhood educators, Karin and Per Alnervik, and they are um, co-founders of the Halonet preschools in Jönköping and Husqvarna, Sweden. And Halonet in Swedish means uh, raspberry, hence the little raspberry in the logo. And in the course of our conversation, where Alejandra, uh, Alejandra and I and, and uh, Per and Karin were preparing presentations for the Regio Consortium, in the course of the conversation about projects and pedagogical documentation that they were using in the Halonet preschools, Karin made this quite casual remark. She said, it's important for children to meet adults who like being adults. It wasn't really emphasized. It was just part of a conversation. It really struck me. So I wrote it down, and I've always kind of wanted to um, dwell on that a bit more. So this is an opportunity to do that. This presentation is fairly short and is really intended to open the conversation then for you who, um, I'm actually, I'm pretty sure all of you will know more about early childhood education than I do. So for you to then say, that's a lovely thought, but here's why it doesn't work, or here's why it's considerably more complicated than that, or, you know, et cetera. So just opening the conversation. So I want to discuss this deceptively simple notion of Children meeting adults who like being adults. And I want to talk about it in relation to what Jacques Derrida has called an ethic of hospitality. And I've taken up that work on hospitality um, in uh, this book, Unlocking the World, Education in an Ethic of Hospitality. And I've talked about it sort of in relation to education in general, but not yet specifically in relation to early childhood education. So I really want to focus on this idea of adults who like being adults as enacting an ethic of hospitality in early childhood education contexts. And I want to ask three particular questions, kind of break down this notion, and that's sort of you know, the more um, philosophical approach. What does it mean to be an adult who likes being an adult? Um, what does it mean for children and adults to meet each other? And then why would it matter that this happens in school or school-like settings? And I'm obviously including early childhood centers and so on um, in that, right? And this is kind of the order in which I will do it. I'll talk about, you know, adults who like being adults. What does it mean um, for meeting to take place? And then why, why would we argue that this should happen in schools or school-like settings? All right, part one. One of the things that really struck me about um, Karin's statement was its down-to-earthness, right? She spoke of adults who like being adults, not adults who love being adults, who are ecstatic or delighted or excited about being adults. To like being an adult doesn't mean you have to display and represent happiness all the time. Certainly not the forms of happiness that we see in popular culture as forms of fun. In fact, to like being an adult does not preclude showing sadness, 
disappointment, bereavement, struggle, and all the other less likable things that come with being a person of any age, and thus also with being an adult. On the contrary, showing the possibility of surviving such emotions and retaining the ability to appreciate, love, connect, and enjoy is what shows a livable life, a life of which an adult, on the balance of it, says, I'm glad I'm here. Being an adult who likes being an adult is obviously not a sufficient condition for being an early childhood educator. One could conceivably be an adult who likes being an adult and who is a poor teacher in all kinds of ways considered important in early childhood education. But being an adult who likes being an adult is not trivial. I might even go as far as to suggest that it is a necessary condition for being an early childhood educator. If children see an influential adult who, who portrays primarily how hard it is to be an adult, how much do kids have to look forward to? How can they imagine themselves finding a place in the world? And that sort of phrase, finding a place in the world, is something I'll come back to when I talk more about an ethic of hospitality. Karen's comment has another um, interesting implication, and that is that enjoying spending time with children is a desirable quality for early childhood educators but not if it becomes a way of avoiding spending time with adults or in the adult world. Of course, we want early childhood educators to be able to join children in play and in their fantasy worlds, but what we want children to learn also is that play and fantasy have a role, have a place also in uh, the world of adults. An adult caught in the nostalgia of wanting to remain a child or be a child again portrays to children that they're better off as children, and that growing up and entering new worlds, while inevitable, are not something to look forward to. Here are some of the pop culture representations of that, this whole sense that adulthood is highly overrated. Karn's comment is an important reminder that when the question, why do you want to be an early childhood educator, comes up, and if it, when it's answered with the oft-heard, because I love spending time with children, that pers person giving that answer is not in that moment reflecting their educational responsibility of helping children across the threshold of new worlds, including the worlds of adults. It's not to say they're necessarily a bad early childhood educator, right? I wouldn't go that far. Um, you, you sure couldn't tell enough from that comment. But it's interesting that this emphasis on, I love children, I love spending time with children, I'm kind of a big child myself. It's like, well, that's interesting. That's not good enough, right? Looking at this comment, it's important to be an adult who likes being an adult. Now, I'm not arguing for bringing back the conception of childhood as a stage of deficit and of children as inadequate, not yet adults who are dependent and irrational and whose main job it is to grow up as quickly and efficiently as possible to the much more uh, preferable uh, world of adults. Gail Canella describes that view well, quote, children are described today as innocent, weak, needy, lacking in skill or knowledge, immature, fearful, savage, vulnerable, undefined, and open-ended, as opposed to adults who are intelligent, strong, competent, mature, civilized, and in control. That's not the point I'm advocating. Okay? That's, a, that's an idea that's out there. That's not what matters here. Both childhood and adulthood, um, and, and these are not binary categories, but you know, both uh, uh, of those phases are uh, valuable stages in life. But without wanting to go as far as the American cultural critic A.O. Scott in the New York Times, which you may or may not have seen, he, he, he declared the demise of adulthood and the celebration of childhood and youth altogether. I am somewhat concerned that the celebration and idealization of childhood can lead to the idea that children should be encouraged to remain children as long as possible because adulthood is nothing to write home about. That, it seems to me, is a misguided nostalgia and not a desirable idea to guide early childhood education. I'm sure there'll be questions and comments about that. Mm -hmm. So the second part, okay, an adult who likes being an adult, but what does it mean to meet an adult um, if you're a child or to meet a child if you're an adult? When Karen Olivick said it's important for children to meet adults who like being adults, she used this very everyday word, meeting. But that word is not at all self-evident. What does it mean uh, to meet, for, what does it mean for an adult and a child to meet each other? Or really, what does it mean for any person to meet another person? To understand that idea of meeting in greater detail, I'm going to draw from the work of um, the Lithuanian French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who was also one of the main sources of inspiration for Jacques Derrida when he wrote about hospitality. 
And the French verb Levinas used to write about meeting was rencontrer. And rencontrer is translated as both meeting and encountering. And you'll see that in some of the translated passages that I'll, I'll show you. Um, another French philosopher, Françoise Dastur, explains that verb. So, she, and, and she's writing about it also in the context of, um, of a psychotherapist meeting a client, for example. Right? What does it mean to meet another person? And she writes, Encountering the other, rencontrer l'autre, encountering the other, that is to say, as the word indicates well, it contains the word contre, against, facing the other, even opposing him or her in full independence and freedom, but also, according to the other sense of the word contre, not just against, but up against, coming into contact with the other, right? So, rencontrer has these two meanings of contre in it. Meeting another person involves both being at a distance from the other so that self and other can face each other. If you're not separate from the other, you can't face each other, right? It also means being touched and affected by the other, by one's contact with the other. Dastur goes on to discuss the particular understanding of the encounter with the other in Levinas's work, emphasizing that the essence of meeting another person for Levinas is that it's an encounter with otherness, with someone who is completely ungraspable and unknowable. This is worth talking about because I'm not sure that's the common understanding in um, early childhood education. And so Dastur writes... For Levinas, the other has nothing in common with me, and that which I must respect in the other is above all his otherness, his alterity. You can ask me about where the word his comes from here in particular if you want. I thus fundamentally disregard the alterity, the otherness of the other, if I include myself with him in a collective experience, declaring it's ours, or if I pretend to form a community with him. On the contrary, it is uniquely in the face-to-face -face with the other that the true experience of the encounter and the true experience of the otherness takes place. End quote. Imagine a scene of a child and an adult facing each other. What do they experience in this meeting? It's perhaps disturbing to those who assume the closeness of adult and child or the adult's ability to know the child to hear me say that such a meeting is an encounter with unknowable otherness. But that's precisely what Levinas and Derrida would argue, and that is sort of my angle here. Now, what I do want to emphasize is that there are two ways in which that term, the other, is used in, um, in the literature, including in the educational literature, and they are not the same. So I just want to dwell on that a moment, because, for example, Gail Canella talks about an undesirable view of children being othered. And that's a form of exclusion, being treated as the other that is the marginalized other, the lesser other. Okay, So that's a form of exclusion that we, that we refer to in the literature as othering. That's not at all what Derrida and Levinas are talking about. They're talking about a really basic kind of existential premise that is the case for everybody. And the core phrase they refer to is tout autre et tout autre. It's lovely in French, right? You have to then go to all kinds of uh, 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 complicated measures to translate that in English. Tout autre, tout autre. Every other, every other person is completely other to anybody else. Tout autre et tout autre. So this doesn't just apply to children, and it's not about a political kind of othering or, tre or marginalizing or treating as other. So I understand you may have that, uh, those traces of that literature, but please don't hear that. It, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, Levinas, and this is Levinas just a few years uh, before, his, uh, before he passed away, um, he talks about this encounter with the other as an encounter with the face of the other. And he writes, the face is present in its refusal to be contained, in its refusal to be grasped by me who encounter that face. In this sense, it cannot be comprehended, that is, encompassed. It is neither seen nor touched for in visual or tactile sensation the identity of the I, the I who sees the other, envelops the alterity, the otherness of the object, which becomes precisely a content, becomes a content of my grasping, of my understanding, of my, um, of my frame of reference. A child and adult meet, come face to face, contre, come into contact with each other, contre. 
Now, for Levinas and Derrida, ethics is asymmetrical. So, they always write about my responsibility to the other, never about the other's responsibility to me. So, let me consider my role, hypothetically, as the role of the early childhood educator, the one in the position of educator in this meeting. A child and I meet face to face, and I encounter the child's otherness. Even though I may know things about this child, I do not know this child, nor can I know what she wants or needs. I'm confronted with the child's vulnerability and with the, the, the way that vulnerability makes an ethical demand on me. I'm not sure what to do, how to respond responsibly to this demand. However, if I jump to conclusions and reduce the child to a statistic on a developmental scale, a member of the population of toddlers between the ages of two and five living in Metro Vancouver, or a diagnostic category, I know I have left the meeting, I have left the encounter, and I have left the experience of the child's call to me. The first call is to remain in the meeting, in the encounter, to remain open to the confrontation with the child's otherness. I do not know this child, but I do know that in meeting this child, the child also faces otherness through my face. Now, it's not the child's responsibility to respond to my vulnerability, although children may do just that, but it is my responsibility to ask, what kind of adult do I want that child to encounter? The child encounters my face, and that is an interface with the world. In my role as early childhood educator, I am a portal to the world. What kind of encounter should it be? My answer, abstract as it may seem, is an encounter that makes the world seem like a place where the child will want and be able to find or make a home. Okay. An adult who likes being an adult, meeting an adult, and now why should we be concerned about that in schools and school-like settings. Some might agree that it's important to, for children to meet adults who like being adults, but that, that is not specifically the responsibility of early childhood educators. And of course, it's entirely possible, perhaps even likely, that children meet adults who like being adults at home or in other settings outside of early childhood centers. But I want to draw a parallel here to the argument that Mel Noddings makes when she talks about the ethic of care. And that might be a framework that's more familiar in early childhood education. Some might think about, so the ethic of care right, revolves centrally um, around being able to establish and maintain caring relationships. And some might say, well, learning to become a person capable of establishing and maintaining caring relationships, that's nice. That's a nice frill. That's an additional feature of education. But really, education ought first and foremost to focus on students' academic development. And for, if you take that perspective, you would say, well, I guess you know, schools, if they have the time, they could offer some opportunities for children to experience what it's like being cared for or to practice caring for themselves, other people, animals, <coughs> objects, or ideas. But it's really ultimately not the core mission of schools. And Nell Noddings fiercely opposes that view. She believes that learning to become a person capable of establishing and maintaining caring relationships should be at the heart of schools, which is precisely why we cannot gamble and, and hope that children will get it elsewhere. Not a frill, it's at the heart of what education ought to be about. And this is Nell Noddings really not that long ago. If you don't realize, this woman is absolutely amazing. She is 87 and still talking and writing about an ethic of care and, and other um, aspects of education. So I have very high respect for Nell Nonnings. Um, she writes that um, the main aim of education should be to produce competent, caring, loving, and lovable people, and so offering students opportunities to experience being cared for and to practice caring is not something that can be left to chance. Each child deserves such opportunities, and we cannot count on the home environment to provide all children with such opportunities. Therefore, it's a fitting task for schools or school-type, um, school-like environments. In fact, she even says that in today's circumstances, it's become even more important. She writes, one of the essential elements in learning to be cared for is continuity. 
couple, children need the security of knowing that particular adults will be a positive presence in their lives over time. And today, when so many children lack um, a continuity in their family lives, and when conditions in the larger society exacerbate the need for continuity, schools must give greater attention to this requirement. So that's from, from Nottings. Now, I'm not sort of switching to writing about, uh, to, to t- um, arguing for an ethic of care. I'm just trying to draw the parallel. I want to make the argument in the same way. And if you want to, we can talk about the differences between an ethic of care and an ethic of hospitality. But my idea here is the same. I don't consider this sense of giving children an opportunity to cross the threshold into new worlds, for them to enter new worlds. To me, that's not a frill that can be left to chance. Therefore, we need to um, offer it in schools. So let me unpack that a little bit. In my view, education at its very heart is about offering newcomers to the world. And in this case, children are a very good example of that. Newcomers to the world, an opportunity to find a place for themselves in the world. And this is how I put it in, um, in the book. I believe that education should be concerned with opening up the world, with unlocking or disclosing it, and making it available to children as their world. I'm concerned with education as the process of introducing newcomers to the world and with the nature of that introduction. Is it going to be a form of assimilation or is it going to be a way that gives um, children the opportunity to make it their world? And it's very Arendtian, so um, you as well very much uh, recognize this. In particular, I'm interested in that introduction as an ethical responsibility of those who already inhabit the world, whatever world that is, to those who've just arrived in it. Now, in some ways, this is... You know, this is a general responsibility, not only that of early childhood educators. I mean, it's like anybody who already inhabits a world has a responsibility of, in a way, passing it on. Whether we think of the world's, um, this is a passage from the book, whether we think of the world's of language or music, of mathematics or chemistry, of agriculture or engineering, and you can, you know, go on and on, give examples, these worlds stretch out long before we who happen to inhabit them now came to live in them, and they will continue long after we cease to live in them. We, and by here I mean all adults, are received into these worlds through formal and informal education, and we have no entitlements to them, only the responsibility to leave them in decent shape so that the next inhabitants, tenants, if you will, can find a place in them without us knowing who who these newcomers are going to be. That responsibility is the basic kind of impulse that, um, that, that moves an ethic of hospitality. But those who live and work with children or other newcomers in some educative capacity, such as early childhood educators, I think have a special responsibility to take on that task, besides being adults, right? And we have a, resp- a professional responsibility not just for what I call showing newcomers vistas of the world, look, out there, there's this interesting world, but actually helping them imagine a livable life for themselves there, helping them um, find or make a place in the world, helping them find a home. So similar to the argument that Noddings makes about opportunities to experience being cared for and to practice caring, I would argue it cannot be left to chance whether children have opportunities to gain access to the world and assistance in making it across the threshold into new worlds and imagining finding a home there. I would say each child deserves such opportunities, and since we can't count on the home environment to always provide all children with such opportunities, I think it is a fitting task for schools and school-like environments, right? Um, Early childhood education centers. So in her casual comment, I think it's important for children to meet adults who like meeting, who like uh, being adults, I think Karin um, Alnervik captured something quite profound about early childhood education. Indeed, it matters that um, children in early childhood education settings meet adults who like being adults, because one of early childhood educators' most important roles is to welcome children to the world. Showing that uh, that childhood is enjoyable, but that it's also worth aspiring to a larger world to which adults have access is a valuable part of hospitable early childhood education.